talk about differentials. Um, this is a differential out of the front of a RV26 um, powered GTR Skyline. And um, tell us a little bit about how this machinery works right here. I mean, basically its job is to bias power from one wheel to the other. The problem with non-limited slip differentials and even some of our competitors is how they bias that power when there's a wheel lift, slip, or spin, and how we are able to do so in a better fashion or more efficient way. Gotcha, gotcha. So this right here, um, this is one of the weak links on the RV26 powered GTRs, your R32, R33, R34 GTR. Um, if you're making over 500 horsepower, make sure you upgrade this. The reason being on this particular application is just the amount of contact area you have between these little spider gears here and side gears. And uh, when you make over 500 horsepower, blam, it explodes and uh, you put a, a hole in that front um, housing, take out the whole uh, engine even. So make sure you upgrade that. Now you guys don't make an upgrade for this yet, but nice. tell us about the upgrade that we see here on the table. So here we brought, uh, this is very popular, the R35 GTR rear and front diff, which actually the rear is one of our bigger differentials that we make, and the front's actually one of our smaller, next to something like an Evo 789. Now, typically in the history of LSDs, the limited slip differentials, this style wasn't popular back then. This is like a, a, a torsen type. Of, of course, this is a modified torsen type, but mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a torsen, whereas most of the time we're gonna see uh, a clutch type, is that Yeah, right? ramp and plate style, something, okay. something like that, which they do have their benefits. Um, really, you can set different ramp angles, for to fine tune the car mm -hmm. coming out of the corner of this and how you really want the car to handle. The problem is you do get a bit of push or understeer with a ramp or clutch type limited slip. With ours, each wheel is still independent. There's no locking, no clutches. Okay. So it, it's better on entry and mid corner. You make up a lot of speed there where you're not trying to fight the car with setup or fight that natural push. Now let's say you had an application out there where your car came with an open diff mm -hmm. and you went and you switched to a torsen, a modified torsen like this and the, with the wave track technology. What is that gonna feel? How is the car gonna handle differently? So everyday driving, you're not gonna feel it at all. Okay. It's really just until you start pushing it, when you start getting that wheel lift or spin is when it will begin to bias power across the axle. But it's not gonna fight you, it's not gonna want to pull the steering wheel your hands. It'd be real right. smooth and controlled. We're just trying to limit that loss of drive, loss of grip or traction that you'll have. Gotcha. Now this Torsen, modified Torsen style, one of the, the things that uh, you were pointing out earlier before we went live was these, uh, these carbon fiber um, uh, patches here yep. that are actually um, a friction area. Why is that incorpororated in this yep. and how is that different than an OEM torsen yep. style? So when we started Wave Track probably 13 years ago now, okay. there, you know, there's other torsens on the market, but they're all doing essentially the same thing. And the problem is when you get that wheel lifter spin, as we talked about, the power is still going out that unweighted wheel. We need to find a way to bias that power across the axle, even in those situations. So we do a couple things. One, we have our bias plate. Okay. So this will sit in the housing like so. Okay. And so now when the pinions drive outwards into the housing, instead of driving into the housing, polishing or burnishing the housing, and then friction over time degrades or goes away, right. we're driving directly into this bias plate. This is a lifetime material. That means put it in and forget it. And okay. performance will be the same from day one to gotcha. forever, essentially. Versus, versus an OEM because they don't have that there and it's just basically the friction of the metal against the metal that gets polished over time, yeah. you're getting a different performance ramp yeah. as, as time goes by. Exactly. So that's one thing that's different with the wave track. So this is one of our patented pieces. Another thing is our wave hub. So this acts like a cam or load generator in the center okay. of the diff. So normally you have axle coming in one wheel okay. and opposite right there. You notice we have that cam profile right there. So what we're doing, we have a, our little preload pack in the middle. Okay. There's also carbon on the bottom of that, that same carbon that's right there. This means that when it rides on this surface, again, we're able to control that amount of friction. These go together like so. And now, when there's a difference in gear speed, this will ramp one way or the other in acceleration or deceleration, gotcha. maintaining or building additional load internally. So say you get wheel slip here, we're still driving power to the opposite wheel. It may be just, doing a burnout or just right. in a straight line, maybe going across a rumble strip to get that staccato effect. You can hear the engine as right. it surges. We're, you're losing drive in those situations. Now we're able to keep that going. Gotcha, gotcha. So 
Your standard torsion doesn't have this. Your standard torsion, as soon as a wheel comes off the ground and loses complete traction, it's driving all the power there. Essentially, and, and yes. And kind of wasting everything. But with this, with the wave track and the, and the modified torsion that you have set mm -hmm. up here, because of these additional friction areas and contact areas and the cam and the ramp, yep. now all of a sudden, you've got power going to the wheel that's still on the ground and planted. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. So both wheels at all times will always have power, so we're not forgetting a wheel. And again, this isn't a locking device or a clutch device, so each wheel is independent. All we're doing is kind of going up and down that wave hub or the cam profile to, again, maintain or build additional additional load. Gotcha. So that, TB, that TBR will go beyond what it was or what it would normally be. So the you're not getting a harsh transition or something like this happening and hitting hard. It's actually gradually putting that power to the wheel that's still on the ground uh, during that exactly. uh, episode. Exactly. Gotcha. It's gotcha. all load dependent. So. Okay. So yeah. So is there any drawback to this design? Uh, now, the modified torsion design. I know the original torsion design, that's the biggest uh, hang up about it. You know, you get a yeah. wheel off the ground, power's going to it, and you're wasting your time. But with the modified, you've kind of fix that. Is there any other considerations in moving to a torsion? Not really. I mean, you really just put it in and forget about it. It's great. You don't have to do anything different with uh, setup of the car. Actually, you can set the car up more how you want to set it up mm -hmm. as far as mechanical grip because you're not trying to drive around different limited slips, doing different things on different ends. Each wheel is still independent, so it allows that freer movement of the car through the corner, into the corner and whatnot. Now, I know on the, uh, on the clutch type LSDs, they'll have a, a one-way, a 1.5-way, a two-way, talking about how the, that locking effect or that limited slip effect works on acceleration versus uh, engine braking and stuff and how that yeah. does. With, with, with the wave track, is there anything like that? Well, I mean, that one and a half way is always kind of a weird thing. It's like yes. either, either it works in forward, it works in reverse, or it works in both. It doesn't half work in one. Right. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of always been a weird one. But no, this one, if you're going to consider it something like that, I guess you'd say it's a two way because it works in acceleration and deceleration. Okay. Being load dependent, you will get more, uh, the bias ratio will ramp higher on acceleration because you're getting more power going through that way. And decel okay. or coast off throttle, you're not getting enough engine braking to ramp it as much as you would on, on throttle in, say, an R35 GTR with 2,000 horsepower Gotcha. compared to other things on, on coast side. So but even the big horsepower stuff, I mean, it, it looks like, you know, especially compared to a design like this, there's a lot more contact area, so mm -hmm. you don't have that issue where you've got these axles, uh, you know, moving these parts that are just so small and yeah. tiny. Yeah, I mean, all of our housings are made from 8620 forgings. All the internals are 9310. Uh, six pinions around, so that's really distributing the, okay. um, the load equally all the way through. Um, all of our diffs internally are pretty much the same. We just have you know, different package sizes. That kind of keeps it easy for us to, to maintain or track inventory and mm -hmm. whatnot. And we're just kind of changing a few things like the spline and a few offset pieces and gotcha. obviously certain things on the outside to fit. Now, is there any type of different tunability to them at all? Is, is, is it doesn't really need to be? It doesn't need to be. Unlike a clutch diff where you'll get a couple different sets of ramps, you can flip things around mm -hmm. to change it how you want to do what you want it to do. This one, it really just put it in and let it do its thing. The cam profile is a set profile. Um, we do have Belleville springs in the center okay. to give that initial bit of preload, but those are already preset. So you really just put in and forget it. Okay. Some cars, like some newer cars, like the new Supra or BMW mm -hmm. M4, they share a rear diff. We make a diff for that as well. And that one, you code out the electronic stepper because that stepper motor can overheat. Oh. Um, we have a customer using like uh, the M4 going up Pikes Peak, mm -hmm. and it was working so hard it just failed. <laughs> so you just code out on certain applications if right. they have an electronic stepper or things like that. But other than that, you can turn off your uh, traction control or turn certain things down that would normally limit. And you'll notice looking at um, through the ECU of data logging that intervention is cut in half or more than in half nice. by quite a bit using this. Now, putting it back together, I mean, you, normally you never have to take it apart, but is it pretty easy to do? Yeah, we can put it together real quick. Any things, if, if you do pull one apart, anything you got to kind of watch out for or be careful of as you're putting it back? Yeah, we recommend not pulling it apart just <laughs> okay. because there's, whenever you put certain things together, it, there's room for error. Right. But really, it's just, you know, we have these, our bias plates on each side. Okay. So we're pretty much just dropping those in. We have our gear that goes to one side. Actually, see, it has a little profile, that little chamfer in there. Okay. So the there's chamfer a, goes there's over a, the outside, so yep. we're putting the axle in. It's yep. easy to and do. And there's a snap ring groove in there for the for the GTR guys specifically. Okay. So that goes in like that. 
Yeah, how do you make, make sure you're not putting the, this side here and there and that one in there? Yeah, A, experience, and B, there's that wave profile. Uh, Some go together differently, maybe the front end of an Audi or certain things where the helix will run opposite and mm -hmm. we have to change things around. Okay. Um, some will assemble opposite, but unless you get yourself a Pontiac GTO or an Audi S4, you're, okay. you're pretty good. And you should never have to take it apart. But right. um, So then the pinion is a certain helix on here mm -hmm. to match the helix on there. Okay. So really just dropping those guys in. They go in pretty simple there. Okay. Everything is working as so. And then we have our preload pack, so we have our pin hub, mm -hmm. we call it that because there's this little rectangle pin on the top with our Belleville spring set in the middle, right. and that pin lines up with that oh, hole okay. right there. So that keeps these two aligned with each other. Mm -hmm. All they're doing is compressing between the two right. um, in those certain situations or forcing themselves outwards. So it's like that. We have our other cam profile right there. Uh -huh. Lines up like so. And then we just drop the other half of the pinions in. Let's do one quick last check. And then there's, no binding there. Should yeah, no binding, binding, nothing like that. And then we're going to look for one of these has a blank for a dowel pin. Oh, okay. So some people get in, they wonder why there's one bolt missing. It's just that dowel pin locator. <laughs> gotcha. So we just drop it in like, like so. And then we don't have all the bolts right here, but right. Um, that bolts one's fully assembled. Uh, ARP hardware for, oh, uh, for nice. everything. So nice. bolt yeah. it up. And then we do have a test after we fully assemble it. We have breakaway torques and things that we check just to make sure as we're assembling these that everything is fine after everything is torqued. Now, when installing these, um, do you have to replace your ring gear bolts? Is it a good idea or is it a necessity? It's, or it's, not, a nece kind of it's not, not a necessity, but it's a good idea. If you have it apart, you can do that. Some bearings are impossible to get a hold of. Um, mm. I think like a TTRS or like the RS3s are huge right now, that DQ500 gearbox. Right. So a lot of people are just transferring bearings. A lot of them have low miles, so the not bearings are deal. good. Yeah. As long as you pull them off and they're in good condition, you don't ruin them when you take them off. Otherwise, if you have new bolts or your other ones, just torque everything to factory mm -hmm. spec, and then everything is mimics the factory um, envelope. So when you set it up, you set up as the factory recommends. So yeah. nothing special for our diff to set up wise. On those bolts, on the ring gear bolts and stuff, should you use any anaerobic sealants, your, your Loctites and stuff? Uh, Loctite. Okay. So depending on obviously the diameter of the bolt and gotcha. uh, whatnot, you'll torque it to spec. What we do is we have a thread patching mm -hmm. on our bolts, so that way we don't have to go and lock tight every single bolt. This uh, is basically okay. the same thing, so when we're tightening them all, we're not sitting there lock tightening right, hundreds right. of bolts at a time, and that saves us time, but when you're doing it, you're not gonna have that service done. You'll just lock tight them all, torque them, and then set up accordingly. Now, in the case of, uh, you know, let's say you're doing a rear diff or something on, on the car and you're putting in the wave track, if you're not changing the ring and pinion, you're gonna reuse the same ring and pinion. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, do you generally have to reset the backlash on the gears and stuff still, or will it basically bolt up and drop in? You do, just because we hold a lot tighter of a tolerance than the factories hold. Okay. Um, we do a lot of these for the BMW cars, mm -hmm. and the BMW cars, it's rare that we see two of them that are alike. Oh, okay. And so, especially on other things as well, you always want to double check, triple check everything as, as you're setting it up, because we're holding real tight tolerances from the bearing distances and some other things that again the factories don't they're not following that tight gotcha so but, but basically you're just going to um kind of maybe shift that in or out basically exactly right? that's all you're doing is checking it before you take it out so don't take touch it out. the don't touch the, the pinion yeah don't don't worry about, about the pinion just the, just the ring just gear, gear and... check initial backlash maybe breakaway torque or um bearing preload i should say pull it out and then reconfirm all that when you put it back together now if you're not comfortable doing it yourself What's kind of the range you should figure you're going to spend to have one of these installed? I know it's different on every application, but you know, let's say you bring a place your front-wheel drive transmission because you're doing a front-wheel drive. For them to throw it in there versus a, a rear-wheel drive, you know, is there any rhyme or reason to the pricing? Yeah, no, I guess it depends on the gearbox. You know, we talk about uh, mm -hmm. the DQ500. That's okay. a pain in pain because all the little solenoids and things like that to pull apart. Gotcha. The main transmission gearbox, take it apart, put it back together a few hours, right? Right. But certain um, uh, these DSGs and other types of uh, gotcha. so dual clutch the, transmissions. On the low end, maybe 150 to 250 bucks, and then if you got something complicated, they're going to nail yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So now on the R35 on that GR6 um, 
uh, transmission, is it difficult to access this part? Or is um, it pretty simple? Is it, it's kind of modular on that one, right? Yeah, it's not, it's not too bad. Luckily, uh, Shep Trans, mm -hmm. he does all the R35 GTRs. Because he, okay. you know, he does a lot of transfer cases and other things for Evos and other things for GTRs as well. He's gotcha. the guy. So we send everything to him. A lot of customers oh, okay. are just buying complete gearboxes from him. Perfect, perfect. Or rear ends, front end pieces from him, and he's uh, selling them as they go. A lot, of, a lot of these guys are doing pretty big power in R35s yeah. these days, and <laughs> they, they need more than just the diff. Very cool, very cool. So this is the front diff? The center section. Okay. Essentially, it's the same idea. There's just no room to be try to share those gear packages to cut down on so many parts. Figure we have 130 or 40 applications at this point. Right. We need to keep the some, somehow so, control the inventory as much gotcha, as we can, gotcha. especially in times like these where getting yeah, sourcing materials is, is tough. Yeah. Are there any questions out there uh, from you guys? I tried to ask what I thought you guys would ask, but I'm just wondering if there's any other questions out there. Yeah, we got a question. Uh, do wave track differentials require a braking procedure? They do not. So there's no clutches, no wearing parts. So really, just put it in and go. Only thing is if maybe you're changing a ring and pinion or doing some other things where the factory service manual or the ring and pinion supplier may recommend doing a service just because there may be some shedding of material off the ring gear and things like that. Okay. As far as this, there's no material shedding or anything like that to worry about. So just be because there's no clutches in there, um, are they less susceptible or less uh, influenced by the type of um, oils used? Uh, we do recommend like a Motul like gear 300 is synthetic. Okay. Um, you want to use something that isn't too slippery though, too viscous. Some make it so it's difficult for the pinions and everything to create that friction between the housing and the gears. So again, recommend the Motul gear 300. Lots okay. Lots of oils out there. You can always email us or call us. Just gotcha, gotcha. Some people, you know, in the middle of some states somewhere, you may not be able to find a Motul oil. Give us a call. We'll get it okay. sorted. Okay, okay. Any other questions out there? Good. All right. Well, Chris, thank you so much for stopping by. No problem. Um, one of these days, you got to tell us a little bit about all the, the Hollingers you guys have been bringing in. Yeah, we're doing a lot with Hollinger. I mean, I haven't seen Ryan Turk yep. around in the in his new Supra and everything. Mm -hmm, so we're doing mm -hmm. a lot with him. You have a Hollinger. Yeah, in yeah. I got in the in the R33 GTR, and uh, it's been phenomenal. I mean, I think uh, uh, put, took it apart maybe about eight years or nine years ago. Uh, Dana, you know, brought it down there. Dana went through the thing and stuff, and I think I had to replace like a reverse gear. That was yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, as far as you know, wave track differentials, that's something we manufacture here in the States is our brand, but then we've represented Hollinger for years, and so we're bringing a lot of stuff in, everything from sequentials like yours to full transaxles. We have a new uh, X12, so 12 inch ring gear transaxle. Oof. She's, a, she's a beast. If you're a PRI, okay. you have an X12, it'll be there, and some other stuff. So come by, we have a few things with flappy paddle setups that everyone likes uh, playing with, right? Definitely, definitely. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. And thank you guys. If you guys have any more questions and stuff, uh, even though we won't be live and stuff, make sure you email us or just respond on one of the social channels here. And uh, we'll be sure to answer you as quickly as possible. Um, so that's it for today with the WaveTrack. Uh, WaveTrack differential. Remember, this is a modified uh, Torsen. It's got a lot of cool uh, advantages over a standard Torsen. Um, basically, the main thing is addressing the big deficiency with a, with a standard torsion, which is? Biasing that power to the wheel that's still planted and one wheel's spinning or losing grip. Definitely. So, well, thank you guys. <laughs>